Thanks to your generous donations to our Kickstarter funding campaign. Clive Barker Podcast presents Fundraiser 6, Bill Seeker. Welcome. This is episode 240 of the Clive Barker podcast. Uh, shoot, I just lost mine. Um, I'm Ryan. I'm Joe. What? <laughs> Hi, I'm yeah. Uh, uh, let's make sure everybody's set up with a movie first. Uh, are set. you set up? You're set? Okay, I'm set. Are you set, Ryan? Or do you have any sort of like opening, like uh, opening uh, logos or anything? Yeah, I've got a Vortex Hankel Hooper production there in lowercase. Okay, we're all set then. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So so for people that are just tuning in, of course, we are uh we're doing an audio commentary for Clive Barker's uh A to Z of horror uh recommendations. Uh A is for American Psycho, and in that book and TV series he covered um Ed Gein inspired movies, Psycho, and now we're gonna be talking about uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh boy, this one's a doozy. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we got some people joining us today. We got Lil Spark Films, Joe Manco. Hello. And uh, is Catalina going to be joining us? No, nah, she. No. Nah. Just, just you today. That's yeah. Joe Manco from Little Spark Films, and uh, you're speaking to us from Texas as well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so. Um, We've got it paused at the uh, a Vortex Henkel Hooper production. I am watching the Amazon uh, Prime rental version, uh, which is like the 40th anniversary that they put in 4K. I don't have a 4K TV, but that's what I that's what I've got paused. I I got a DVD copy. I got Shutter. All right. All right. So, Joe, do you want to do the countdown? When we'll unpause? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, you guys ready? Yeah. Yep. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, click. Rev up your chainsaws. Okay. There we go. Yeah, interesting that, uh, that they, all of the credits are, they, they don't have any capital letters on people's names. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, I like this intro. And, uh, I want to say something about Grave Robin. <laughs> This is kind of weird, but I did go and look up uh, what was going on in Texas, and I found out actually uh, the groundskeeper of a cemetery in Beaumont, Texas. uh, Last month, actually, there were some grave robbers that opened a casket and damaged two tombs in the Beaumont Cemetery. So Uh. unfortunately, the Forest Lawn Cemetery on Pine Street, uh, they found a couple of mausoleum tombs damaged and a casket was opened. So... uh, in Texas, so we're still we're still doing this. Uh, in, in this opening crawl, they have chainsaw as two separate words, but in the title of the movie, it's just one word. Yeah, August 18, nineteen seventy three. Yeah. So this movie came out on uh, October first, nineteen seventy four. So I was uh, four months old when I think when this movie came out. Huh. So I did not go see it in the theater. Uh. <laughs> That's that's a good choice. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think I, I, I saw an article. I decided to stay home. Yeah, I saw an article the other day that someone brought uh, their kids to watch uh, Midsummer, that movie, oh, and wow. uh, and the, someone recorded them and put it up on Twitter like they were grabbing their kid and running out when there's like a big lesbian orgy scene, and I was like, wow, but there's like lots of bloody stuff before that so the kid was there watching that that's kind of nuts it's oh, okay geez. to watch hatred and violence and brutality but yeah. not love. yeah well i mean in midsummer it's not love <laughs> yeah. right you know? so this opening uh, i think this is supposed to be that uh, the weird guy taking pictures of the the corpses that he just uh, dug out of the cemetery it's uh like oh police. yeah right i didn't even think about that the uh, the hitchhiker dude Oh, do you think it was the police taking pictures, Joe? Yeah, 
because it's been. always around. Yeah. That's what the narration was at that that, t- that crawl. It yeah. was it was uh, a as police uh, documentation. Sure, there's a radio okay. playing. Uh huh. Um, so actually, I look up some of the locations um, for this movie, Sorry. and this this is actually the um, uh, Baghdad Cemetery in Leander, Texas. Oh yeah. Yep, real place on Route 183, about 25 miles northwest of the city. And that kind of creepy, whiny sound that it makes when they're taking the photos, it seems like that got ripped off at a lot of future horror movies. Everyone Uh, rips that off. Yeah. Yeah, and well, it's like now I've seen finally, because just for for everybody out there, this this is my first time seeing this. I mean, I saw, I watched it to prepare on Thursday night, two days ago. Mm-hmm. That was my yeah. first time watching this movie. I'd never seen it before. This is, yeah. this is for essential, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, we're like, and I'm, I'm going to be real. Like here in Texas, I probably saw this movie for the first time when I was, I want to say nine or 10. Oh my gosh. Holy shit. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, no. and you know, my, my upbringing is a different story. But, I mean, I did watch this when I was a kid, and I thought this was the most metal movie I'd ever seen oh, at the time. Yeah, and, absolutely, uh, yeah. Older, like, yeah, this is milk and cookies. But, dude, everyone has seen this film in Texas. Oh, yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah, yeah well, and, and my friends all talked about it, but I wasn't allowed to watch movies like this. I was very sheltered. I only saw this movie when I was in my early 20s and uh, at, a, at a horror movie festival. In Portugal, and I have to confess, I did get up a couple of times to walk out of the movie, and I was like, ah, let me just sit down, you know, especially the scene where Marilyn Burns is being chased by Leatherface, you know, and that scene goes on for like 10 minutes, and it's just constant screaming, and I was like, oh, wow, I I, I need to go outside for a minute, and then I would get up, and then I would sit down again and be like, okay, that's cool, it's a movie, let's just keep watching it, it's fine, it's gonna get better, and then was like, ah! Yeah. The more you watch it, there's yeah. less, there's less of that. The more you watch it, I I just I guess to me because uh, you get become more familiar with the story and you start picking up yeah. little things here and I don't know. I started paying attention to like little shots, you know, like how the camera just goes underneath the swing and everything yeah. and stuff yeah, like in that. In armadillo, or how they call it in Texas, uh, possum on the half shell, <laughs> like the state animal. <laughs> Nothing. Crunchy on the outside, soft on the inside. Mm. Armadillos. Dude, those things are lightning fast. Yeah. It's crazy. So this it's opening a... scene here with this uh this uh guy in the wheelchair getting out of the van. Frankly. Like, yeah. You know, the, for for me watching this the first time, I'm like, oh my god, what you know how what is this this guy doesn't stand a chance, this poor guy in the wheelchair. Oh yeah. yeah. Hell. Oh, but you know what? He's not the first guy to go. He's no, not no. even the second or third. No, yeah. that's true. I was. I also thought about that while while we were, I was watching him. Like, well, he's lasted a lot longer than I expected. He's actually the last guy to get killed. You think Toe Hooper did that? To, or the you know they they wrote that wrote it that way to really just yeah. throw people off. It was like one of the first films to probably do that. Yeah, yeah. maybe. I, yeah, I'm sure. It's, you know, you try to be sympathetic to this character, but he's just so whiny through the entire film. Yeah. Then when <laughs> when you actually get that, oh, shit moment when they're going in the middle of the woods and you, you see like, rawr, 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 it's like, ah, and then he takes it yeah. and it's just like, oh, man, finally. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I had to say it. Yeah. Well, and then he's got that he's he's constantly like playing with that stupid knife while they're driving. And I keep thinking they're going to go over a bump and he's going to hurt himself with it. Yeah, yeah. It does put some tension there, right? I mean, yeah. all the, the time he's holding the knife, and it's like, come on, it's it's weird. And they pick um, up a crazy guy hitchhiking, and he's still got that knife out. It's like, geez, yeah. put it away, dude. I know. Um, Man, this this wardrobe, like, if this was made today, oh, my <laughs> God. Ain't, there, there ain't nothing indie about this. Good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Man, this stuff would be so difficult to find. Oh man, I love the van though. The van is awesome. It's, yeah. Uh, Have you I guys? Think... Been... Oh, I'm sorry. Continue. No, I was just gonna say it's a 1972 Ford Club wagon. 
I want to say, like, uh, have you guys, you guys, when you guys were in town last, y'all didn't stop, go to the gas station. No. No, yeah. I've heard that now that gas station has barbecue. They, they've had it since they've opened, and oh, my God, it's good. Oh, really? <laughs> it's so good. You get to eat inside the toy store. Yeah. Gas station. It's a toy shop now. Yeah. But uh, that van, they have a... Uh, it's not the exact van. It's not the same van, but it's the same model. And, dude, it looks exactly the same. Yeah, uh, yeah. Just sitting there parked outside uh, next to the next to the shop. And yep, it's, so it, it's always there. That's weird. This guy, this w- weird random guy just grabs her by the arm and starts dragging her. I'll take you over to the sheriff. I and love it, the it, drunk guy on the floor. He's it's just kind of giving up. It's a little bit of a red herring, right? Because it seems like he's yeah. some kind of weird creep that's dragging her off in the woods, you know, but uh, yeah. nothing really comes of it. No, they're, they're going there because uh, for people who are watching us for the first time, ho, ho, you're in for a treat. But um, they, it, they went there to see if their grandfather's grave had been uh, uh, disturbed. So that's why they're driving uh, over there. Yeah. And uh, and he's like, oh, yeah, I'll, come here, little lady. I'll take you to the sheriff and he'll let you know if your grandfather's you know grave was uh, disturbed. But yeah, so back to the gas station. Um, it's located, it's it's Bilbo's Texas landmark in Bastrop, Texas, I think. Yeah, that's where the gas station is. That's like right outside Austin. Yeah. And so that's great that they got barbecue now. Yeah. Oh, it's so, so cool. Yeah. But uh, so they have here, cabin there too, and you could actually watch. I think they show all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies outside. You oh, can like, wow. look on the grass outside the cabins. It's in the middle of nowhere, man. I read an article that said the current owners uh, bought it in 2016, then restored it, and uh, they even have that green van that you said. And now they offer brisket and sausage by the pound. Oh. And uh, four cabins for rent. I think it costs around 120 a night. And uh, they also have a campsite. Um, they have souvenirs over there, like uh, autographed cast photos, a poster of the gas station for $8. Oh, and an act- and they're selling an actual plank from the gas station itself for ninety bucks. Jeez, <laughs> they got a lot of cool stuff there, though. They got—I mean, it's loaded with all these retro toys and masks. Huh. They got clothes, and they sell VHSs and DVDs and Blu-rays, and they all kinds of stuff, man. Nice, uh, nice. Yeah, so I look forward to going there every time we trek down to Austin. But they're not open on like Sundays, which is you know. Or Mondays, which is when most people are driving away from Austin. <laughs> if Man. if this movie were made today, that his whole that whole speech about uh, about him describing the way cattle are killed, that would have happened yeah. to him. You know, yeah. they they totally would have done that, set that up that way. Yeah, the way he goes, like, oh, they just do like this this uh, this thing with air gun. It just goes into the cattle brain. It's boom, puff, boom, puff. yeah. And he goes on and does that for like seven times. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, we get it. He's totally, he's totally socially inept. He can't figure out that nobody <laughs> likes, you know, listening to him when he's talking about yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, is this what do they call this guy? Uh, the hitchhiker, uh, I think. Something top. Oh, that's uh, no, that's in the second one. That's Bill yeah. Mosley. Yeah, which I yeah, think yeah. those characters are cousins. There uh-huh. was actually a small stint of a comic book, I want to say, for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But, uh, yeah, I want to say that those two characters are cousins. Yeah, they probably are, because this guy is going gonna, is gonna to get mangled pretty bad by the truck at the Chop end. Top. He's called yeah. Chop Top in the second film, and that's Bill Mosley. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in, in, in this one, he's only credited as the hitchhiker, I think, right? Yeah, uh, Ed Neal. He's just the hitchhiker, so yeah, it's a totally different character. He is so weird. Why would anybody want to pick him up? Yeah, I know. And see that giant freaking birthmark on his face. And he's got that weird dead animal pouch hanging from his neck and the camera. It's like, I uh, know. It's well, it's immediately like a, a, a foreboding of things to come with all the, the dead skin animals and all yeah. that stuff at the house. Yeah. So do you think these yeah. guys? These kids in the van are uh, suburban slash city folk, or they're used to living with all the hillbillies. Well, I, I think yeah, were... you would think he that him and his sister at least grew up with it, right? I don't know. I mean, he, they, it seems like a big surprise that those weirdos are living next door to his father's house. Because I mean, the guy driving the van seems like you know he goes clubbing every night. 
He's a hip <laughs> yeah. cat. Yeah. It was, it was a seven, I think they just went there every once in a while to visit their grandparents, like maybe in the summer or something, you know, because they remember the wallpaper on the wall in the bedroom and they remember the little uh, swimming hole. So I think it's just kind of a vacation thing. They'd be like, oh, let's visit grandpa, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But you're right. They sound totally like suburban, you know, kind of almost hippie, like, you know, cool cats. But, well, can so you imagine totally still picking up a guy like this? Can you imagine how much disposable income they must have to just, instead of selling that house when the father died, just let's just let it, you know, fall apart. Yeah. <laughs> Spoken like a true ex-realtor, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, and that thing looks big. Yeah, yeah. These are just then privileged, privileged children. Yeah. Yep. Maybe, maybe oh they God. Ought. Yeah, this is pretty tense here. You know, it's like, oh my God, what is? He's got a knife. Is he going to start stabbing everybody in the? Van, dude, that dinky knife. Like, if it pushes, if if he like, well, I don't know. This guy, we know him that he is pretty awesome with a blade. But Franklin, on the other hand, I think if he tried to like stab someone with that knife, it'd bend forward and he'd like cut his thumb open. Yeah, had yeah. a lock knife. Yeah, he's clearly not a sound mind to be safe. And this guy, yeah, hey, right, yeah, fuck you, Franklin. You'll yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he's just enjoying the heck out of it. It's so weird. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And the, the way they do that is there's a little tube in the back of the blade that we can't see. And then they just squeeze a little thing with fake blood and they pretend like they're cutting their hand and it just the fake blood comes out the little tube in the back. Hey, so so now correct. at this point, it's like, OK, put the knife away. Nah, I know, right? <laughs> and he pulls out a. A straight razor. Yeah. It's like, it's a good knife. He's like, I'm sure it is, man. That's no knife. That's a spoon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. They're just, you know, road tripping down Texas. But they make Texas look so bad in this one. I mean, yeah. yeah. That's a thing. That's a thing. Like, you're, uh, when you, when you shoot films in Texas, or I, I think it's, a lot of states, uh, you have to shine the state in a positive light if it's going to be your subject matter. Oh. Right. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, like Robert Rodriguez, I want to say I read that he had to, uh, like, move production out of Texas because he, you know, they're giving him a hard time. And part of the hard time is because, what is it, the Robert De Niro character in Machete uh -huh. uh, was too much uh, rep you know, to seem too much oh. like our governor. Yeah. And, uh, so it, he's made it a point to make filmmaking difficult as hell. Oh, yeah. God. And this flick, I guess, well, clearly it doesn't, the, the, the rules were different back then. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know if they got permits for any of this. This total gorilla. Oh. Yeah. So, I get what you're saying. I mean, if you're going to get uh, subsidy or tax cuts or whatever, you, you they want to make sure that you're not going to paint the state in a bad light. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, because this, you said, I mean, yeah, not all Texans are psychopaths. I mean, <laughs> as any other state does. Right. It was it, it was lovely when I was there in uh, Dallas, uh, yeah. Fort Worth. Uh, it's like wine country. Like, right, Ryan? We, uh, yeah. You rented an Airbnb in this place that was kind of like wine country, so people go there to do wine tastings, and there's yeah. wineries there. Yeah, that's, yeah and grapevine and grapevine. Yeah, yeah. I remember that. That's that's yeah. beautiful country. Yeah, man. Yeah, there's some cool stuff out in Grapevine. They have the British Emporium, which is where we go for all our Doctor Who fixes. Nice. This is so weird. He just happens to have this little piece of tin foil for burning up his pictures. It's very convoluted. Yeah. yeah. It's like, you're not paying for it, then I'm going to destroy it. Yeah, right in front of you. Uh, the the gunpowder, I guess. That's I think that's what it's supposed yeah. to be, right? <laughs> it looks like he skinned a pos uh skinned a, like a fox or something to make that pouch. Squirrel. A squirrel. Yeah, I think yeah. it's a squirrel. No, that's not a squirrel. Yeah. Man, he's he's really weird. Uh, I got a bigger knife. Here it is. <laughs> God. And when he uh, when they throw him out and he rubs his face on the van, uh, rubs his hand on the van, 
Do you think that there was supposed to be some sort of symbol on that thing? Or yeah, they sure random? talk about that a lot, right? There, that uh, Franklin talks about that a lot. If that means something. Yeah, and I, I think I read something about it at one point. I'm not sure if that was supposed to be some sort of signal, so when they stop at the gas station, the guy would know that they met that guy. I, I, I mean, I'm just making this the, up. It Are, doesn't really seem yeah. likely. I mean, what? How, yeah. how did he know he was going to cut open his hand and rub it on the back right. of the van when he got kicked out? Yeah. He, he seems pretty yeah. chaotic and random. Yeah. What's funny in this movie is that... N- Several characters, when they get mad, they just stick out their tongue and they just blow raspberries. Yeah. Right. He does that, the hitchhiker, then Franklin's going to do that. It's it's just weird. Yeah. Probably yeah. in a movie nowadays, they would just release a string of insults and profanity or something yeah. like that. But this <laughs> right. was... Yeah. I think, they just well, go like... Pfft. I remember doing that a lot at, at that time. Really? <laughs> You're the oldest guy here in the in the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I was born in '76, and uh, yeah, I'm '85. <laughs> oh, you you were born in '85. You're yeah. not you're not '85. No, old. he's literally <laughs> '85 years old. <laughs> he's just he's just well preserved for his well, age. Well, you 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 look really good for '85. No, that's Photoshop. <laughs> and all this astrology stuff that they keep talking about i guess if this was supposed to um at the time you know i mean satanic panic we were talking about that on the last episode uh there was a time in america where people some people thought that astrology was kind of like uh demonic in nature or something that uh Mm. you know i honestly i don't believe in it but um yeah i guess this idea that uh planets would control your fate and whatever and they just keep talking about that and like Saturn is in retrograde and it, it's going to increase the uh, malefic, you know, powers and all yeah. that stuff. But it's but all a bit of foreshadowing. It is foreshadowing. Yeah. I mean, it all sounds like kind of mumbo jumbo, but there is bad stuff going to happen to them. And who is this weirdo with the, his head is crazy. Like his, his forehead is huge. Yeah. It's, he's it, just it, sitting there looking at the sun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's I, like, he he starts washing the windshield, and then they're like, we don't have any gas. Stop washing the windshield. Yeah. I think there's a name for this guy in the in the script, in the credits. I just oh, forgot. Man. That old man. Yeah. He, of course, he sees the blood on the van. Yep. Yeah. And he's being an asshole off, you know, on the get-go. Yeah. So I have a question about this gas station barbecue place. Do you think that he served them human meat oh yeah of course he did yeah like that's the whole thing that they kill people dismember them make sausage and then sell it yeah he does chili cook-offs all the time in the second one. Oh shit spoilers oh he's, well, i've only seen this one he's an entrepreneur yeah oh man but just the amount to... the amount that he would have to find people and murder them just to keep his business going i mean he would be a lot easier to use Pigs. Oh man, you're you're gonna go you're gonna go crazy if you start thinking like that. When you see the second movie, there's literally <laughs> thousands of skeletons underneath their house. Oh god, <laughs> it just goes over the top. The side of a mountain. Yeah, yeah. Dude, it's man, the second one is wacky. It's got Dennis Hopper in it. So, yeah. so the police are completely incompetent. Yeah, and he goes rogue, and he's like a fucking Texas Ranger. Yeah. And he like runs around this fucking cave of dead bodies with a shotgun screaming at him and a cowboy. Yep. Wow. <laughs> it's dope. And uh, the third one's got Viggo Morrison. That kind of sucks. Uh, <laughs> really? Yeah, but yep. the fourth one's got Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger. It's, wow. it's nuts. That one is just crazy. To Leatherface walking around with like a dress, and that's just nuts. Face drag. Leatherface yeah. drag. Well, he's kind of in drag in this movie at the end too. Uh, he's yeah. wearing like a gray wig and he's got like lipstick all over the face. Yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, man. That's it's good stuff. It's um I like the way that uh they pick the clothing, the outfits for the girls. Like you got Terry McMinn. She's wearing just those uh red shorts and uh that top that you can see her open back. 
And uh, in an interview, she did mention that she was kind of concerned about that. She didn't want her cheeks to show, <laughs> especially in the, the way that he was shooting her, because you notice that it's very exploitative. He keeps shooting the girls from the back and from the bottom up. So, you know, it's it's I don't they're meat, dude. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to chow down. Yeah. Yep. He's I mean, that's how I see it. I mean, you know, granted, you know, that's the sex appeal of the film. So, but, uh, you so, know, so why do you go ahead? What? No. What are you uh, asking? I was. So why do you think that uh, he's trying to discourage them from going up to the house? I mean, he knows exactly what house it is and it's right next door to them. And he's, he wants, but instead he just wants them to stay here and eat some barbecue. Oh, wait, who, Franklin? Yeah, no, the um, the gas station dude. The, I guess he's like the father or whatever. He's oh. just trying to make sure that they stay stick around. You know, I think that uh, he just wants them to stick around. And so then, you know, so then they could kill them there instead of at the house, or maybe he doesn't he, want them to discover what's going on over there. He's just trying not to help them. I think he's just trying to obstruct them from knowing, you know, any information that's relevant to them getting out of here. Yeah. So, He's like, I don't have any gas. You know, why don't you stick around here? I don't have a telephone. Barbecue. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he gets a kick out of feeding them human barbecue. You know, who knows? Uh -huh. So cool thing. This uh, the script. I found a copy of the script at one point and the family house wasn't even in the script until later. Uh, he just decided, oh, yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and put that family house in there and make a few scenes. I think the, they were improvising a lot. With this uh, on oh. set. Huh. And uh, the original story uh, name was going to be Leatherface. Then it was going to be Head Cheese. It oh, was God. crazy. Yeah, they finally settled on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Can oh. you imagine if this was called Head Cheese? We'd be doing a commentary <laughs> track for Head Cheese. Yeah. I don't think it would have made it that far. <laughs> yeah. I don't, know. I don't know. I mean, it got... Into theaters. I don't think you could sell to a theater a movie called Head Cheese. Well, maybe in 74. Yeah. But as an R-rated film, no. I don't know. Why did you take me down that rabbit hole? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's just a working title. But a lot of the music in this, a lot of these atonal like uh, music that we're going to be hearing later in the movie, this was actually done with uh, Toby messing around with like weird instruments and sometimes just actually like farm utensils. Like there's one track that's basically just a pitchfork being dragged across the ground and stuff. That's uh cool stuff that they did for this movie. Very weird music. And that house is huge. It's, it is, it is a shame that they just let it fall apart. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. There was a really cool podcast with Mick Garris called Postmortem, and he um, he did uh, interview uh, Toby Hooper, yeah. uh, which he worked with, of course, in other movies. Uh, but I do recommend that. I'm going to put that one in the show notes as well. It's the Mark of Zorro. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. So uh, it's crazy the way that... Uh, way that uh, they shot this in the middle of the summer, I think, and it was just so hot. And some of the cast had to wear those outfits for like five weeks without getting them washed because oh, they. I it smelled like it smelled like shit over there. I heard. Yeah, yeah. You know, every there was like literally dead animals on set. This was before uh, Peter Laws. Yeah. Uh, they uh, Toby Hooper thought at one point that he would go to a butcher shop and buy a bunch of animal carcasses and heads and stick them around stakes around the grandparents' house. And uh, and then, you know, they said, you know, that's not going to work out, you know. And then so what he did was he grabbed all that stuff, threw it in a pile in the back, poured gasoline all over it and set fire to it. And that, fo that smoke went into the house and then people got sick. Oh, God. Yeah, that is terrible. Gunnar Hansen, Leatherface, he had a horrible time because, you know, he was heavy, big, and also his suit was kind of padded, and he had to wear that, that leather mask over his face. And he was just fucking miserable. Oh. Uh. Because they didn't want to wash the outfits for continuity because they were afraid that the colors would change. Huh. Because uh. they were just cheap outfits, so, so, you know. Pretty gross. Pretty gross, yeah, I would say so. 
I mean, you remember when we were in Texas, I, you know, sweat over sweat. Yeah. And it's like at the end of the day, you just want to take a second shower. And it's like, man, imagine having to take those clothes off, put them in the wardrobe department, and then the next day come in, put those clothes back on. Oh, yeah. Jeez. This this place is not very ADA friendly. No, not at all. Well, but he's supposed to have grown up there. Right, right. It's just that that thing is all crumbling apart, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all full of, like, roots and, and vines and stuff. Yeah. His yeah. lazy ass has been pushed around so much. Yeah. Yeah. He couldn't pull himself up. Yeah. Does he even need that wheelchair? I Yeah, I think he does, because when he falls around, when the truck goes and, and he falls, he can't get himself up again. So, uh, but yeah. that's a good point, yeah. Oh, he, I could, yeah, he knows. I know he needs a wheelchair, just... You know, he couldn't pull himself up, and he's so whiny. This guy is pathetic. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hate him. Anyway. So, interesting bits of trivia about the house, um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house, is that it uh, it was moved over the years. I think at one point they, 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 they lifted up the house and drove it somewhere else. Jeez. Yeah. Well, does that ruin the integrity of the house? It's, uh, let's see if I can find that little article here. I imagine it just gets weaker if you do that every time. Yeah, yeah I'm not talking about this one. I'm talking about the one where Leatherface and the other people live. Yeah. Oh, well, still, even then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this house is just, you know, crumbled. Uh, so the movie had an opening in Austin. Uh, I think at the time, Toby Hooper was a... He was a professor at the University of Texas, I think, uh, a documentary cameraman. And he tried to keep the gore and violence of the film to a minimum so he could get a PG rating, but that didn't work. He ended up with an R rating. He was asking them, um, you know, is there any way I can get a G rating by with a scene where a woman gets stuck in a meat hook? And they said, yeah, that's no way. And he's like, well, <laughs> what if I don't show the hook going in there? Oh my it's god! Like, like that matters. Yeah. <laughs> this is where everybody is going off to have sex or you know have fun, and this guy's the guy's going to be left behind. Yeah, we'll be back in an hour, Franklin. You hang out in this in this horrible, dilapidated house that might have squatters in it. Yeah. This reminds me. The other day, I was in a group ah, of. Uh, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. I was I was in a Facebook group the other day. Uh, it's called Weird Secondhand Finds That Need to Be Shared. And someone posted uh, a, a jar full of little animal vertebrae. And uh, they said, hey, I bought this at the store. It's like, why did people, like, carve these little bird heads on bones? And people were like, dude, those are vertebrae. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, some of these are greasy. Yeah, because they're like... Covered in organic matter, probably. Yeah, gross. That's gross. Ugh. You guys, sorry. No problem. Everything all right there? My signal went out. Oh. Sorry. Last thing I saw was when they uh, went off, when they ran up the state, when they ran away, left Franklin behind. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, now the the couple are running or running through the woods to the yeah creek or whatever. They made this movie on a $60,000 budget in 1974. Yep. They came, they saw it. $60,000? Yeah, 60000 Wow. Uh, I think Gunnar Hansen wrote a, a book about his experience called uh, Chainsaw Confidential. I actually got it on Audible just before we started this, so I haven't had a chance to, uh, to listen to it. But I'm going to listen to it because it's huh. got to be fun. Yep. There's a bit of trivia here. On a production day, uh, they broke for lunch, and uh, Steve Friedman, who was a producer, noticed a scruffy, long-haired hippie making its way through the food line. So Friedman walked over to the guy and said, hey, do you work on this movie, man? And the guy had a plastic plate with barbecue chicken wings and said, uh, no. He's like, put the chicken back. <laughs> <laughs> yep. What's your time code now? I'm at 3148. Yeah, they're just walking up to the house because they're hearing the generator. Yeah, I'm going to start at 3155. Okay. okay. 
They should be walking, uh, approaching a barn or something, going through a, a field of uh, yep. sunflowers. Sorry about that. No problem. Yep. This looks like something that uh, they would come across in American Pickers, the TV show. Like, hey, look at this guy. He's got a barn full of vintage cars. <laughs> yeah. They weren't super vintage back then. Mm. Right on. Right on. You know, people talk a lot about how House of Thousand Corpses is nothing but a Texas Chainsaw Massacre ripoff. Uh -huh. Dude, I don't see it. Every time I watch this, I don't freaking see it. Well, I, I've, I I saw House House of a Thousand Corpses back when it came out, and you know after watching this, I'm like, wow, there's a lot of similarities. How? Other than it being hillbilly. Well, yeah, you got a you got a hillbilly family that uh, you know these 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 hapless like, you know, clueless people sort of wander into their lives and uh, get hacked up and mutilated by this hillbilly family. And Bill Mosley makes a weird art with uh, people's body parts. Yeah. <laughs> Just like in the beginning, yeah. With Dwight from The Office. Yeah, right. And, uh, and, and, uh, Any movie oh, what's his name? Bill uh, oh, from The Nerdist. What is his name? Chris, uh, uh Chris Hardwick. Hardwick, Andrew. yeah, was in that movie too. Oh, he was? Yeah. Oh, man, it's been a while since I saw that. You should watch it, especially, like, really soon. No, yeah, I, I've watched The House of a Thousand Corpses, and I've watched The uh, the Devil's Rejects. And uh, have you watched the last movie that he did? I, I think it's supposed to be – did that come out yet? Like, the prequel with Sid Haig and uh, um, Rob Zombie's wife? Uh, I think no, was I a, haven't seen that one. I've, yeah. seen, I've oh. seen Devil's Rejects. There's a tooth. Yeah. What's your time code? I'm at 3409. They're in the porch. She's sitting yeah. on the steps and he found a tooth. And he's putting it in her hand right now. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Uh, all days. I yeah. don't know why it keeps kicking me off like that. So the chicken infested Sawyer family home stood on Quick Hill Road, Round Rock I 35, about 10 miles north of Austin, Texas. And then in 98, they dismantled it and transported it to the grounds of the Antlers Hotel, 1001 King Street, Kingsland, way to the northwest of Austin. Wow. Yeah, this is the part in the movie you're like, oh, you idiot. You know, look at that place. Don't go in there. Yeah. Yep. Wow. So n now this house has been renovated as a restaurant, <clears throat> and it stands in the grounds of the Antlers Hotel. Ugh. Is it so a glass place? Uh, yeah, it looks nice. I saw a picture of it. It looks like a cool restaurant. Well, why would they need this building? I don't know. It's part of a hotel complex now. It's next to a hotel. Uh, Th this scene is, like, amazing. Like, oh. right here. Bam. You know, just the red wall inside the door and all those skulls on it. And then, you know... Leatherface just yeah. walks out and is like, holy crap. Yeah. And the way he closes this door, it's just insane. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Looks like a, a door to an abattoir, which is basically what it is. This dot right here. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> she, she didn't like this shot for the longest time, and then she finally, you know, in an interview said, ah, it's okay now. I like the shot. It's actually pretty... You know, it works. And uh, at the time, she said she was sitting in the premiere of the movie and she was just going way down in her seat because she was like, oh, my God, they can see my butt. Yeah. That was a great shot, man. Yeah, I think so, too. Funny thing is that the restaurant where this house is now, they also have a vegetarian special. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the irony. It's It was called the Chariot Grill. Yeah, this is uh I like the way that the angle of the camera is just slightly askew. Yeah. Yep. Everybody all the the women in this movie just, you know, when it's like the when they should be quiet, they're always screaming. Yep. 
And also, he put, like, uh, Toby Hooper put, uh, along with the skulls of animals and plastic skeletons and stuff, he also put, like, bits of rancid cheese so the house oh. would smell bad. So people were constantly coming out of the house after they cut just to smoke and then puke. <laughs> uh. It was terrible. It was really awful for them. Uh, it was pretty, pretty weird. I like that the chicken is lying in a little canary cage. It's like, what? Yeah, yeah how did they get that? chicken in there i guess they just put the take the bottom off of it yeah the bottom comes off and then yeah. they just snap it on but this is uh a little exaggeration of what they probably found in the ed gein house right i'm sure ed gein was probably a lot cleaner and man more couch. organized than this this couch is badass man yes yeah, you could imagine someone like uh like spawn from the comics just sitting there that hand is totally fake, though. It looks like total plastic hand. <laughs> so that skull. Yeah. With a steer horn going through it. So, yeah, I mean, this, this for me, it was like, holy moly. And yeah. just the, 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 the soundtrack in this shot is just crazy. It, yeah, it is so creepy. It reminded me a little bit of Night of the Living Dead, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all these like skulls and teeth on the floor and chicken feathers. It's like, oh. And it goes on forever, too. I mean, this thing yeah. goes on for like two or three minutes. Yeah. Yeah, nowadays movies don't really take their time, you know, in the same way. It's like, um, this reminds me a little bit of Alien, too, where you take 40 minutes to, to get to know these people that are just going to all get murdered. And it's just the whole vulnerability of her because it looks in some shots like she's not wearing nothing but just the shorts. Yeah. And then she's like laying on the floor on all fours and you can see her spine and she's like heaving. Yeah. It's just so uncomfortable. Yeah. And all those giant, you know, cow like skins hanging from the walls. Yeah. Those are some big cows, by the way. Oh, yeah. This this scene is so uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, this is God. where it gets you the first time. This is where it's like, for me, it was almost like the first time I was like, ah, I got to get out of here, man. I got to stand up and walk outside. Oh, yeah. It was like, mm -hmm. damn, that's, that's gruesome. Yeah. You know, Fangoria used to have the Golden Chainsaw Awards. That was created by this. They, 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 it was right. a tribute to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. It's fitting that Fangoria is now in Texas. Oh, yeah, really? so yeah, I think yeah. they went uh, they went online subscription only for a while, and now they actually have physical magazines again. Yeah, yeah. Did you get those? Or well, I haven't had a chance to get any of those. I have a Fangoria. I have a new Fangoria. I have a number issue two, uh, the Joe Bob Briggs issue, and it's like him covered in like sent around by zombies, and it says he is risen. Yeah. Uh, that's that. That's what got me into Shutter was just to watch the Joe Bob Briggs. Oh yeah, yeah, dude, it's fun. It's, I know. It's, it's really fun. This but, guy's uh, kind of being a jerk. <laughs> he, he's coming to get you, Franklin. Yeah, give him your zip code. Yeah. He looks like he belongs in the MC5 or something. Yep. So, um, real blood, real sweat, real tears. Yeah. When you see them actually sweating and dripping sweat, it's real sweat. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it was really hot. Even some days were well over a hundred degrees and, uh, they wrapped filming in about a month. Um, so they, they shot everything within five weeks, more or less. Yep. Franklin's making a big deal about his pocket knife. And and you start to think, well, maybe this pocket knife is he's gonna somehow defend himself with it, but no. Nope. You never see it again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and it's a pretty terrible defense anyway. When Gunnar Hansen uh was gonna start uh shooting the movie and he was talking to uh Toby Hooper, um he just saw the mask and his outfit before they started filming, and then 
his first response to Toby Hooper was when he saw the mask, he says, you know, I'm claustrophobic, right? Oh. <laughs> so he puts on the mask and he can barely see out of it. The eye holes are essentially the same size as his eyes. Yeah. And the mask sits forward from the face a bit, so he had no peripheral vision at all. And, uh, yeah. The, it, the, Doug Bradley wrote a book called uh, Sacred Monsters, Behind the Mask of the Horror Actor. And there was a section where he talks about, you know, Leatherface, and there's some excerpts of Gunnar Hansen talking about his experience making the movie. Hmm. What is that it's, again? It's a book by Doug Bradley called Sacred Monsters. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you ever read that, but it's a cool book. It's got all this stuff about, you know, monster makeup and iconic monsters that used makeup, like Leatherface and Pinhead. And he said um, he had to shave his beard off because they didn't want any facial hair to show. And they brushed his hair up into a top knot to get it out of the way. And then huh. they put the mask on. It was a full head mask, and it was laced on the side under the ears on both sides. Oh, wow. And, and the lacing is very obvious because the whole idea is that, you know, this is skin from a corpse just peeled right off. So it was just laced right on his head with rawhide. Huh. That's Yippers. disgusting. <laughs> first, and uh, the first time he uh, auditioned with Toby Hooper, he said something like, it's like, because Gunnar Hansen is really tall, right? So he's a really big, big dude. He had a beard, long hair. And he's like, so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, let's see if I can find that. He asked him something like, so, um, are you crazy? He's like, no, I'm a pretty nice guy. He's like, all right, well, you know, you're pretty tall. We'll give you some heels to make you taller. And then he ends up being disappointed because he's like, oh, man, I'm not going to use my acting skills at all, am I? As, yeah. <laughs> well, he still kind of does. Yeah. But he was the, the nicest guy. Everybody who met Gunnar Hansen, you know, every, everybody said he was, you know, always a very nice guy, a nice gentleman. But people have this idea that he was just this, this lumbering maniac just because he played Leatherface. And, you know, it's, it's all a movie, folks. Yeah. It's just a movie. Just like uh, Doug Bradley doesn't spend his night sticking pins into his head. Yeah. <laughs> But it was sad that, that Toby Hooper died in 2017, and I actually pulled up the tweet from Clive Barker. He uh, wrote in honor of uh, Toby Hooper that the chainsaw is now quiet, but it will forever be heard. Rest in peace, Toby Hooper. It was August 27, 2017. No, oh, he's looking at the towel from his friends that they yeah. left there. There's a video with the, uh, I think it might be from the 40th anniversary uh, reissue of the movie. There was some behind the scenes footage and there's a lot of like alternate shots of uh, Leatherface doing his le chainsaw dance. And oh, in one yeah. of the, in one of the shots, he actually throws a chainsaw in the air and it lands by the gutter. I think that's okay. when he was just like, ah, I'm done. But one time <laughs> he was doing that thing and he said that he threw the, he was swinging that thing around and it went up in the air and it was running. And he just threw himself on the floor, put his arms over his head, and then that thing just landed a few yards away from him. Jeez. I was like, that was scary. Yeah. Because that was a real chainsaw. Oh, my gosh. Was, was he actually running the chain on it, too? I mean, that's pretty dangerous. I don't think he was. I don't know. I should know more off the top of my head about this movie, but I don't. I just, I, I don't think he had the chain on there. This is so yeah. creepy here, too, where she. <laughs> Funny bit of trivia here. She uh, uh, that thing was dry ice and um, it wasn't really a running refrigerator. And he gave her a cigarette and he asked her to smoke inside the 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 freezer. Um, so a little bit of like, you know, smoke would come out when they open up. It looked like it was cold. And then she was like, yeah, so I'm inside that thing kind of puffing away. And he's like, oh, ready to go? Yeah. And then when she came out, she was like, because she was smoking inside a box, she was also looking pretty blue. It wasn't just the makeup. It was also oh, because wow. she, was, she was smoking in there and she was getting a little kind of like asphyxiated. Uh, dizzy. Asphyxiated. Jeez. Right. I, I know. Poor set. It's worse than a trauma set from what it sounds like. Yeah. No safety to humans whatsoever in the Jeez. making of this. 
So here he's thinking, oh, there must be other people if this guy just showed up at my house. Yeah. Ah, oh, God, just him running his tongue over his teeth. Yeah. So underneath the mask, he must be kind of deformed or... or... Yeah. You, Do... you, learn, you learn later in the series that he's... Uh... Yeah, so he's deformed. He's like born without like a part of his face or whatever. Much like you know Jason, he his appearance changes every film. Right, right. I think this is the only one where they don't rip the mask off, though. Oh, maybe the second one. But yeah, they don't rip off his mask in this one. I don't believe. No, they don't. Actually, I don't even know if you were meant to be. Uh, if you're meant to know if he's a man or a woman yet, this character. Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think they call him your brother, right? To the yeah. to the hitchhiker guy, he calls he says your brother. Yeah. Huh. And it's like this dude has a flashlight this whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a jerk. Why is he flashing it on his face? <laughs> yeah. He wants to tell a ghost story. Spooky. (laughs) Yeah, and also, you know, they wouldn't be able to have those headlights on for too long. Otherwise, they would just kill the battery. Yeah, and they leave. When they they leave, they just leave the headlights on. Well, it doesn't matter because they didn't have the keys anyway. But, yeah, I get it. If they could find the keys, they could drive away. Yeah. But by the time they get there, that battery's going to be dead. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying they should have shut the lights off before they left. I mean, yeah. How do, they like, find it? How do they find it again? Oh, Franklin's got a flashlight. That's right. Yeah. Right. Good point, though. Yeah. So yeah, they're yeah they're sticking out like sore thumbs in the middle of the yeah. night. Yeah. Yep. That's a good shot. Oh, Franklin's so annoying. Holy crap! Yeah. <laughs> he has to be in charge. Well, I think he's afraid that she's going to grab the flashlight and just leave him in the dark. Oh, which, yeah, totally. Know, would be pretty scary. Yeah, the the thing is, I don't know why they bring him anyway. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's just one of those things. You I, know, you well, have... I guess because it's his father, but he, yeah. didn't, he didn't want to go. His shirt's all ripped up. Yeah, when he uh, rolled down the side oh, of the road. Oh, I see. Here's a here's a little bit of uh, a description of Leatherface in the script, in the original draft. It says, um, says the mask of Leatherface is a close fitting hood rather than a mask covering the entire head and slit to accommodate the ears. The face of the hood is human but shriveled and leathery. The hair is human hair. There's a throat piece which is on which is tucked below the collar. Over his clothing, the masked figure wears a heavy black rubber ap- apron. I think in the movie they just went with like a, a white apron instead, I guess so you can see the blood better. Mm. Um, they burst through the room at the end of the passage and into a large room. So, yeah, that's how they describe Leatherface. The other uh, films, I want to say his apron is like more intense looking. Like yeah. as the films progress, like it eventually becomes like some sort of leather that's like it looks pretty tough and heavy to wear yeah and then the chainsaw changes too right it yeah. gets oh, all man. actually yeah that's like one of the coolest things about the third one is that saw his family the third one is the the, the chainsaw is huge oh mm-hmm. yeah i'm not saying like phantasm three huge but <laughs> yeah. it, no it's huge oh my god this is like one of those the 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 biggest, most effective, scary moment of the movie is coming up right now. Yeah. It's like, I was watching this last night, and I was sitting here in the dark in my office looking at some of my computer, and I was just chilling on my office chair, and all of a sudden I was like, I jumped up in the air, like two two meters in the air. It was like crazy. Yeah, this it's coming up in a minute or two, but it's like, holy crap, that really scared the heck yeah. out of me. It was like 11 p.m., and I'm sitting here in the dark watching the movie while... My wife is sleeping in the bedroom, and I, I was like, "Holy crap!" Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, yeah. And I've seen this movie before. I should yeah. know that this thing is coming up, but it's just the way that he does it. Ah. Oh. 
And Franklin does not know how to point that flashlight. <laughs> no. So you said you watched this when you were like nine years old, Joe? That's that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, I, I watched a lot of movies when I was a kid. But, you know. Well, and also as an adult, but no, like, yeah, I, I watched this probably. I was, <gasps> oh, God. It was probably like one of my, the Halloween films I got to watch, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, we, you know, when I was really young, you know, I got yeah. to watch this kind of stuff like. You know, uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, Friday the Thirteenth, and Halloween. Yeah, this is a or, little, a little bit of a cheat because they would have heard the chainsaw running. I mean, idling as they were coming through the woods. Not that unless he pulled the, the cord like right then. Did he? Yeah. I mean, that's his. That's his uh, hunting tool of choice. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, he's. I'm sure he know knows how to start that. Yeah. Without trouble. Yeah, if it's a good chainsaw, it can start on the first pull. It doesn't have to be like the bum, bum, yeah. bum, 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 bum. Yeah. It can just, like, if you do it right, bang, yeah. it starts off right away. So, but yeah, there's a little bit of a cheat. It's just like when when sometimes uh, two people are, are walking down a street and then they look to the side and the camera pans and there's a bunch of people there. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you would have seen that on your peripheral vision. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. So this is one of the scenes that I was like, I'm going to get up and walk out for a bit, but I didn't. And I was watching this in a big theater, and I was like, man, this this is messing me up. Something fierce. Really? Yeah. yeah. It, is, it is really intense. But yeah, talking about watching horror movies when you were a kid, like yeah. my wife told me that uh, she saw Scanners when she was four. Oh, geez. Yeah. yeah, that one has like the exploding head. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, wild. I want to say I was probably at a similar age when I first stumbled across scanners. Yeah. I mean, nowadays you look at that and you're like, oh, yeah, that's nothing. You know what I mean? But for a kid, it's my six year old watch scanners. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, I remember walking into the t to the uh, living room when I was a little kid, like little and seeing uh, Freddy's Nightmares. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah that's kind of the TV show. Yeah. Yeah. I remember walking in on that. There was a show nobody remembers. You remember uh, uh, it was uh, based on, uh, I think it was done by Wes Craven. It was called Nightmare Cafe. I remember that. You remember that? Nobody remembers that. It's I like remember. I thought I thought that was an awesome like show. It was like this cafe that uh, I think uh, Robert Englund owns the cafe or something. And uh, there's two people who work there. And then there's all these adventures of people walk into the cafe. And it's like an interdimensional thing. And it's uh, it was a great show. I, I missed that show. I need to find out what happened to it. I, I don't know if it's on DVD or anything. Yeah, that's uh, – dude, good luck. I mean, there's – I mean, we I, weren't we talking the other day about uh, transmutations? And it's like it's never made it to DVD. It's only Laserdisc and uh, VHS. Yeah. Yeah. Mean, well, well, it is on DVD oh. now, but it didn't It didn't when it, when, when it came out. But now no. there are DVDs. Well, no, there's, no. There is. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, oh, yeah. yeah Rawhead got a DVD, but I don't think Transmutations did. Yeah. You know what? You're right. Yeah, you're there, right. There's still a lot of stuff that doesn't even, you know, move to DVD. Yeah. And even then, like, doesn't move. To, I mean, like, a lot of the films that we're into now get Blu-ray releases. Sure. You know, I um, think that um, I think that they should have when when uh, Kino Lorbert made that Rawhead Rex, they should have just put in Transmutations as a bonus on there. Yeah. yeah. Well, Transmutations is on DVD now. It's from uh, Black Rabbit Video, and I'm just looking. I'm looking at it right now. It's fourteen dollars ninety nine cents. Okay. Is that a is that a North American? It's a region free NTSC USA. Wow. Yep. I had no idea. I've never even seen that before. Yeah, because I, yeah, because I remember seeing this. Huh. I've been anyway. hunting. I've been hunting for something. Yeah. Are you seeing it on e eBay right now or Amazon? No, BlackRabbitVideo.com. Oh, okay. Yep. I mean, there's countless editions of Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Seriously, there's like, yeah, there's like the one remake and the franchise remake, but. I mean, you go to buy this movie on DVD or VHS or Blu-ray, and yeah, shit, it's it's unfathomable. I mean, yeah. like, which and, which copy do you get? Like yeah, Hellraiser, 
And there was a DVD version I, in, in England for marketing film, uh, but it's, I think, in German, and it's called Underworld, because Transmutations also came out under Underworld. Um, uh, so I got to give props to Toby Hooper here for being able to shoot this in what seems like pitch black, but uh, still everything is sharp and you can understand what's going on. Great lighting here. Well, I think that's the be you know, probably some celluloid right there. He's staying focused yeah. on celluloid. And you can't not, check it right away. Because it's not easy to shoot like in the dark like this, right, Joe? No, it's not. Not remotely. So, I mean, I wonder what kind of lighting they're using. And it's that's, not safe to run around in the woods in the dark with a running chainsaw. Due <laughs> to the mask. Yeah, that's what my mom told me. Never run, never run around with a chainsaw. Yeah. Like, yeah. I ran around with scissors all the time. Nothing oh ever happened. <laughs> That's the survivor's bias. Yeah. Oh, this is where she meets the guy from the gas station. Yeah. He is so weird in the, the scene where he's going to... He's going to take her to the house, and he puts a bag on her, and he just keeps stubbing her with, like, a broken broomstick, and it's like... Ah, that's just the performance is so amazing. This guy it's was just he just great. was he just kind of poking her with the dull end, or was he actually like stabbing her with it? I think he's just poking her with the the, the broken piece. I don't know. It's yeah, just... it's hard to tell, but she's all kind of beat up and bloody by the end there. Jim Sidow does a great performance in this, and he's also in the second one. His character is so weird. He says like. He's like, oh, don't worry, we're not going to hurt you. It's oh, everything's going to be okay. And he says that even when she's tied up and in his truck. Yeah. And yeah. and uh -huh. he's like, oh, I don't take any pleasure in killing. But then he's like, he's like got this horrible like grin on his face while they're jumping around and yeah, whooping and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just part of his character. It's just his character is supposed to be this weird, you know. He has to. He probably has to pretend he's normal because he runs a business. Yeah. And uh, he has to deal with people going in every day. But, uh, but yeah, he just puts on that mask. But inside, he's a total psycho. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. And he's been in all in a bunch of like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies. But let's see, an actor, his filmography is just like six movies. He was in Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He was in the movie called The Wind Splitter in 71. He was in another movie called Hot Wire. Oh, this is the moment of realization where I'm like, that stuff is probably human meat. Yeah. Yeah. Go plans. You don't like it. Yeah. He was in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and then he was in 1987. The last credit is for a TV series, Amazing Stories. Oh, yeah. Mick Garris yeah. uh, produced that series. Yeah, really? he died in two thousand three, age eighty three. He stays on uh, the convention circuit then. Uh, maybe. I mean, he died in two thousand three uh, oh, in hey. Houston. Yeah, that's too bad. But uh, I don't know if he ever did any conventions in the meantime. Probably. Uh, uh, yeah, horror conventions probably weren't as big back then. No, but I don't think they were. Yeah, like he's going to be, we're going to help you. You don't need to worry. He's, he's just grabbing the, the ropes to tie her up and put her in a bag. It's like yeah. uh, Marilyn Burns, man. What a role. I mean, the other girl who gets put in the hook, she said that after certain days when they were shooting the, the scene with Leatherface, at the end of the day, she would have no voice left at all with oh, all the screaming, screaming and all the stuff. Yeah. And it was nothing compared to how much she has to do. Yeah, can you imagine that? And apparently they did multiple shots, multiple oh. takes. You know, she's saying like, oh, 30 takes of just running around screaming. And it's like, man. Yeah. God, this guy, he just looks creepy. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. He was in Texas, and he used most of his cast was from Texas, too. So they were pretty much unknown at the time. I think a lot of them. Well, I know Ed Neal lives up in Fort Worth. Yeah. He, they, he does the cult classic convention a lot. Mm -hmm. Been there a couple times. He's a cool dude. Nice. He's, he's super nice. 
and he's funny. I mean, you get him talking, he he can go on a rant, but man, sure. he, he's hilarious. Uh, Marilyn Burns is actually doing a movie now. It's in post production. Uh, let me see if I can figure out the name of that project. She, uh, let's see, she plays Sally in this, and then she's done a lot of stuff over the years. Now there's a movie in post production where she plays Mrs. Hill in a movie called In a Madman's World. And that's probably going to come out. It's directly based upon the infamous Houston mass murders. The film centers around Elmer Wayne Henley's life before, during, and immediately after his involvement with Dean Coral and David uh, Brooks and their killing spree of over 28 victims from 1970 to 1973. Did you ever hear about this, uh, Joe? No, Mm-mm. I have not. Elmer Wayne Henley. Houston mass murders. Now I want to look more into this. It's kind of funny him doing, oh, you can't, you you know, you can't uh, leave the lights on. Yeah. Cost electricity is enough to drive a man out of business. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, you know, you would probably have better business if you didn't murder all your customers. Oh, man. So (laughs) creepy. Like this whole shot shot here. Like the light from the dashboard. Yeah. Which, yeah. It's just. It's it's really disturbing. It's really disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Just a crazy. total asshole. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep, so uh, the, the music and soundtrack that accompanied the movie was actually made up of seven original songs by different Texas artists. And uh, then there was the original background effects track by Toby Hooper and Wayne Bell. Uh, I don't rem- I don't think there was ever an official release of the soundtrack. I mean, at this point, there may be. It might have might have come out in one of these like 40th anniversary editions or whatever. Yeah. But uh, really amazing stuff. So there's Timberline Rose by Waco and Gladhand. There's Ar- Arky Blue. Plays uh, Daddy's Sick Again and Misty Hours of Daylight. And there's a band called Los Ciclones that play Feria de las Flores, Parade of Flowers, and Poco a Poco No, Not Little by Little. Huh. And then they, uh, Toby Hooper used cymbals, African instruments, and uh, the screeching you hear during Sally's encounter with the grandparents and at the end of the credits is a yeah. pitchfork coasting along the edge of a table. Oh, like nails on a chalkboard, sort of. Oh, yeah. Yep. It was, did he not want to stop for that guy? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. he, it almost was like he was going to run him over. Oh, my God. He just likes to. It's weird, like, how he's sort of a tyrant in this family in this scene. But then later on, they're like, we do all the work. You're just a cook. And then you think, is he going to stab you for saying that? But, you know, yeah. and, and the, their family dynamic is just really hard to understand. Oh, man. Just wait until you watch the second movie. It's it's crazy. <laughs> man, it's a shame, though. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like after the second one, it... This con- this family starts to it just well I mean yeah you break away from the core the core group which is mm-hmm. these three guys or it would have been four but there's a it just gets really dissonant you know you don't know who's a part of what anymore what mm-hmm. the family tree is and you're like are these just friends are these other psychopaths I mean <laughs> oh. Yeah. yeah he says you left your brother alone. Uh, okay. So well, now, he's mad about that now. Yeah. I think he's just finding things to be mad about. You better yeah. hope your brother didn't let any of those kids get away. So he's mad, I guess, because that guy just kind of wandered well, off there's... down the road to take pictures of bodies or dig up bodies or something. I don't yeah, I think they, they do all sorts of stuff. Most of that stuff is animals. Uh, yeah. Toby Hooper, they, they actually used actual animal blood for some of the walls, oh, uh, which, of course, started stinking up the place. They used the remains of eight cows, three goats, one chicken, two deer, and an armadillo. 
to create an authentic slaughterhouse atmosphere. And they used an actual real human skeleton from Japan because it worked out cheaper than buying an actual fake plastic skeleton. Oh. So there is a real skeleton in this movie, which is freaking nuts. I wonder who that was credited to. Yeah. And uh, it's just... And Marilyn Burns' outfit uh, during the scenes where she's running around and then they're slicing her and whatever. It's um, after after they finish fil- principal photography, uh, her outfit was so drenched with stage blood that was virtually solid by the last oh, day of shooting. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. He's like, you didn't let him get away. And, then he, and he's like pantomiming no, that he didn't. And he's thinking about it. Oh, I got to think of something to get mad at you about. And then he's like, yeah. oh, the door. Yeah. He's just, yeah, he's just finding shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's just one of the things that I think is really amazing is when they're at the dinner table and the lamp is an actual human face. Yeah. <laughs> that okay. is just crazy. Can you guys explain to me about Grandpa? Because I thought those were corpses upstairs. Yeah, Grandma is a corpse. Grandpa is still alive. And he's still alive in the second movie, too. Yeah. So, but he just sits there with the dead grandmother in a chair until they come and get him? Yeah. That's right. Yep. Totally neglect that old man. Oh and the God. and and the mummified, poorly taxidermy dog or whatever it was next to them on the floor. Oh, jeez! I think actually probably got some sort of some form of necrosis. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Because his uh, oh God, he's got uh, he, his blood is all dried out. Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, it's like sand almost, or you know, because he's his rigor mortis is kicked and he doesn't really move. Yeah, he's paralyzed. Maybe, maybe that's a, a symptom of cannibalism. Yeah. You know, during the dinner sequence uh, where they're going to slice her finger to get grand, granddad to, like, slurp the blood of her out of her hand, uh, actually, they, they had – the crew had difficulty getting the stage blood to come out of the tube. So instead, they just actually cut her finger with a razor. Oh. So it's actually true. That she actually got her finger sliced to make that scene, which... Oh, my God. Again, I mean, I don't know how much of this is embellished myth, but I'm reading this off of, like, an article that talks about the behind the scenes, and it's like, that's nuts if they actually did slice her finger to get the shot. Man, it was the 70s, you know? Yeah. They they were just making up as they went along, you know? And also, people... People have different memories of what happened, and it's hard to know. Like, you know, when we were doing our interviews with Simon Bamford and Ann Bobby, they both have different had different accounts about the when when Onaka exploded. Right. Simon Bamford said they had uh, they put like some sort of explosive on top of him, and they blew up uh, some stuff. And then we see that, or was it Ann Bobby? That Ann said Bobby that? said matter, that. Yeah. yeah, that 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 they had those explosives like right on his back or something and yeah and then simon beff was like not at all it was just a mannequin and it had some yeah. condoms with like dust inside and then yeah. it explodes and the dust goes everywhere yeah so so i was wondering if he was supposed to be some sort of like a, a an undead thing or a zombie or something but i guess not he's just really well, old and whole, messed up the thing about this movie it's just that it's kind of like a big nightmare right i mean it's, yeah. there's no logic to it i mean it's just you walk out of like, you know. Ow. Texas. Yeah, that does look real. Yeah, you walk out of like this van in in the middle of Texas, and all of a sudden you go into a different world, that it's like completely like a nightmare. So yeah. that's in the post mortem podcast. Uh, Toby Hooper told Mick Garris that he works his movies, he edits and re edits them, and he he does all this stuff. He treats them like he's making music. So that's why they got this kind of music-y, like, video yeah. feeling sometimes, where it's like it's just her shots of her eyeball while yeah. a pitchfork is, like, being ground against the floor and yeah. there's symbols and stuff. It's yeah. just meant to evoke this, like, visceral, you know, almost dreamlike reaction. Oh, the lenses they use in this film are phenomenal. I have no idea what's going, what they're using, but that last shot when she was... You know, it was like a profile shot with Ed Neal behind her. Mm. Like, this almost fisheye look to it, uh, you know, how they were 
they kept her like dead center. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, it was brutal. And then they did like a quick crash zoom out, like from the house, showing like you're in the middle of nowhere. Golly, that was great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Grandpa's alive. Yep. And, and there's like fresh arms on that chair. They're not skeletal ones. So that right. must be one of her uh, friends or her brother. Probably Jerry, yeah. And this scene goes on way longer than it should, too. Yeah, it's which just, is, you know, kind of adds to how uncomfortable everything is. Yeah. <laughs> There's the lamp. Yeah, is that her brother's head, the the Franklin? Uh, it looks like it's already been, like, mummified and dried out. Yeah, so, so maybe not. not. Probably like a corpse that uh, the hitchhiker stole. Yeah, this is nuts. Do, do you think that this also uh, is part of that uh, that myth that uh, cannibalism makes you turn crazy? <laughs> I think you have to be crazy to be a cannibal. Well, yeah, yeah, it's sort of a... It, that, yeah. Well, you know, you got mad cow disease. You know how that got started? They were feeding, like, cows, like, the, the ground-up remains of other cows. Yeah. <laughs> That's not something you want to do for a long time. That's going to make some weird shit happen. Yeah. Yeah, it drove him mad. Yeah. Yeah. Freaking, um, there's an episode of House of that where he uh, has this one guy that he can't, you know, can't figure. It's like the one guy that house can't figure out and by the yeah. end it turns out he was a cannibal who was on the run from the cops oh, oh wow. man damn like, that's crazy it was a good episode um but i don't know it's yeah i, I used to like uh, dr house it was cool hugh laurie is awesome uh i i found out something here in an article from film goblin it says that ed neal who starred in the film as the hitchhiker he used to watch the movie uh, a bunch of times at a cinema in Austin after it was released, and he would come up and un and uh, tap people on the shoulder, <laughs> and then he would lean forward and start acting like the hitchhiker and freak out some people. And oh, then, of wow. course, the cinema asked him to stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> He's a weird guy, man. He genuinely had a... He's genuinely proud to be a part of this film. Well, yeah, I mean, anyone would. It's a, it's a cult favorite. Yeah. Yeah. He that just he crazy. had just said I take no oh, pleasure good. in killing and now he's like sitting there kind of giggling. Yep. Yep. Oh my god, look at that. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, there is some uh oh man, look at those eyes. Major shot yeah. and says, Yeah. Uh, and oh, the tears wow. coming out. Yeah. This so is um Yeah, it, this is so nightmarish. And um, the guy who played Grandpa, um, the guy called Dugan, John Dugan, he was actually 18 years old when he shot this movie. So Grandpa is actually 18 years old. Oh. What? Yep. Uh, yep. That actor? Yep. What's wrong yep. with him? <laughs> the centenarian patriarch, played by 18-year-old John Dugan in heavy prosthetic makeup, ended up drinking... Uh, Marilyn Burns is real blood because, Ooh. you know, they, they had to cut her finger. Yeah. And they didn't tell the actors. I mean, Marilyn Burns figured it out, of course, because he sliced her finger. Yeah. But uh, years after, uh, Burns complained that he was uh, furious at the time after they shot the scene because, like, I didn't find out until years later I was actually sucking on her blood, which is kind of erotic. <laughs> That's crazy. What's he doing to his mouth? I guess he's feeding him something. Yeah, yeah. Damn. <laughs> and uh, Jim Sidow, who played the the guy from the gas station, he uh, he said uh, when he was supposed to beat up Sally with the the, the broomstick, um, he at first had trouble with the the violence in the scene, and he couldn't get himself in a place where he could simulate the the beating. Um, but then you know he had like. Uh, Toby Hooper and and uh, even Marilyn Burns like started prodding him to actually strike her and said saying like things like hit her hit her harder hit her some more and then he eventually kind of got into the scene and they they shot it. Wow. You know Marilyn Burns says hit me don't worry about it. Yeah, it's well, dude. This stuff ain't easy, man. I mean, especially they've already been putting themselves through pain, torture. 
just to get this film made. Everybody was all about it. But, I mean, to shoot, you know, something as simple as, you know, someone just getting hit while they're in a chair. Yeah. yeah. And when he said, like, Grandpa killed 60 guys and he could have gotten more if the hook and pull gang hadn't gotten the beeves out of the way, it's like, what is... Th- sounds like a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. Did he kill 60 people? Or is he no, talking spheres. about... Oh, okay. At the slaughterhouse. Yeah, yeah. He was, like, their top killer at the slaughterhouse. Oh. Hit her in the head, Grandpa! Yeah. Oh, this scene, man. This scene is crazy. And it, it, it drags out a long time because Grandpa can't do anything. Yeah, yeah. So when you guys were shooting the torture with with Paul Taylor, um, were there any moment where people, like, felt a little like, oh, I need to take a break or something like that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, every take. It was, yeah. it, this was a, it's not a feel-good movie. Yeah, I know. I read the story by Paul yeah. Kahn, so I know there's some brutal stuff in there too. Yeah, I mean, we could we 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 did what we could with what we had and uh, and what we prepped for under the circumstances, and you know, I could have I would have much enjoyed to have like probably three more days of shooting, just with, that was not possible. Mm. Um, but uh, man, it's you know. It, it's it's heavy, you know, when you start doing stuff like this and it's high energy. Yeah. These, these guys are working on celluloid, so it's way more difficult to, like, lose a take. Yeah, expensive. But, uh, yeah, I'll hear it here. It is. But, uh, you know, when when you're shooting something that is that, you know, high energy... Uh-huh. And you lose it, it's it's maddening. And everyone in the room is stressed out. The actors are stressed out. Everyone needs to take, you know, 10 minutes to go have a smoke, reset. Yeah. You really and, feel for her because she's been tied up all night. And, uh-huh. you know, then she in the in the they did a good job of showing what it would be like if you'd been tied into a chair all night trying to get up and walk. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Ah, oh, this scene here. Whoa. He's just coming out. But yeah, I mean, I've heard of uh, actors on set who are like doing the scene, for example, where they have to cry. And uh, sometimes, you know, they start crying for the scene and then the take stops and they just keep on crying. They can't stop. You know, they're in that place emotionally. And it's like it's hard for them to just turn it off. Some people can do it, but, you know, others just go for real, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, and you can't you can't. uh, You can't do the take too many times either, because if you do, you know. You got to accept that. Oh man! Ooh, yeah. God, right under the wheels. Woo! That was Franklin again. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, you if you do, you have to expect the rehearsal, the rehearsal to be decent. Mm-hmm. You no, know, no matter how you know you want it to be perfect, it's just you're scared. I mean, I was terrified. You know, you know, and then you do a practice before the take. You know, you do a practice with every shot and. Like this is what we're doing. You, you know, we practice it two, you know, maybe one or two times, and then you, you know, hope to God that your first take is good because you're going to do a second take for safety, yeah. and chances are your second take will not be as good as the first. Right. So when you watch the performance, you can't do it too many times because your actor is saving it for the camera. Bam. You know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I didn't expect this. I thought that that guy, that truck driver, is going to die. Oh, man. I just don't understand why he gets out of the other side of the truck instead of just, you know. Well, maybe he just ran over a guy, so he's like, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to run away from this maniac. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you know, the torture, I... I, 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 (laughs) He just kept running the other way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, screw this. I'm out of here. And House of a Thousand Corpses ended like this, only it turned out that it was one of the Firefly family was driving the car, right? Uh, yeah. Spoilers. Here's another real-life horror thing that Toby Hooper went through. I uh, just found out reading this that, uh, oh, here comes the scene. Oh, my God. Yeah, look the, at this the dance. dance. The sunset dance here. It's like, this is iconic, man. This this has been parodied and tr- paid tribute to in all sorts of, like, movies and TV shows. 
you know, cartoons even. It's it's crazy how iconic this thing has become. And then, of course, in the second movie, he does this every time he's on the, the camera. Oh. <laughs> so that's the only, yeah, the, the way it ends just like that, cut to black. Yeah. It's just great. So it seems like uh, Toby Hooper, I just found out, he was actually, when Charles Whitman committed one of the worst mass murders in U.S. history in August 66, uh, he went up to the tower in the University of Texas in Austin and he oh, killed yeah. 14 people. Um, Toby Hooper was in the campus and he had to rush to hide from the sniper. Oh, wow. Which is insane, right? I mean, geez. That is, that is something that started out back then and it's still going on in this country. It's crazy. That guy anyway. was a Vietnam veteran, wasn't he? I, uh, I think let me that, look that, that up. clock or that, uh, tower shooter guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, it was, um, yep. Anyway, so, holy crap, right? I mean, we just saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, crazy, crazy movie. I mean, it's it's kind of a, a trip. I mean, the second time around that I'm watching it now, you know, I watched it again last night and watching it again, it's, it's fine. But the first time, it was yeah. quite an experience for me. And I, like I said... It took me a couple of days to get rid of the whole feeling that I got out of the movie. So yeah. at the time, you know, you're used to seeing, oh, yeah, there's like Bella Lugosi coming out of a coffin. And it's like, oh, it's Frankenstein. And kids would watch that on TV, black and white, you know, when they were kids. But then this movie came out and it completely changed the the rules of it, I guess. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. It's a heck of a job by Toby Hooper, you know. Yeah, and you would expect uh, that the bad guys are going to get it. You know, the bad guys are going to get, they're going to get revenge on them or or beat them somehow. But you know, all she really was able to do was just get away. And she was one of the first final girls, you know, in horror. You know, where the final girl is the the last character that mm. ends up escaping the monsters, just like Kirsty in Hellraiser, you know, and other uh, Sigourney Weaver in in Alien. Yeah, Sigourney yeah. Weaver, right? And uh, Texas, and we still doing horror in Texas, right, Joe? Lots <laughs> of horror, all the time. We like it. I don't know why. It's really hot. It's <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Cool, hot. And it, you know, effects like that, you know, prosthetics and makeup, and you know, it. Why do we do this to ourselves? Because we really, genuinely like doing it. And uh, there's a. Uh, Things start, you know, starts to get itchy and uncomfortable. It's yep. stressful. Oh, I man. bet. Yeah. So, Joe, thanks for being with us today. You know, we're uh, gonna plug your Indiegogo for the torture with Paul yeah. Taylor, who was uh, Pinhead in Hellraiser Judgment, and it's got a lot more people in there too. But uh, so, you guys are trying to raise some money to yeah. uh, do the post production. Yes. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we've done actually pretty awesome the pat, the, the first, uh, week, you know, we raised up to 17%, I mean, wait, or 19%, something like that. Yeah. Uh, uh you know, and you guys are trying to raise $4,000. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just $4,000 to, you know, help us get this finished. We had the, you know, we, we had an investor come through actually last night and, uh, Oh, wow. Help us. Uh, so we're this, you know, it's uh you know raising money still and if we can make the four thousand goal, uh you know still then that means the film will get done better faster. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. We're gonna put another link to that on this episode, and uh, you know thanks again for being with us. Thanks yeah, for bringing a little bit of Texas to our Texas Chainsaw Massacre commentary <laughs> yeah. track. Yeah. You know all the best for Little Spark Films, and I hope that we eventually get to see you guys again in Texas soon. Yeah, yeah, man, for sure. Thank, I, we 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 miss y'all. I know, we miss you guys too. Yeah, it was great. All right, man. Support independent film. You know, watch trauma movies. Support the torture and Indiegogo and hashtag Paul for Pinhead. Paul for <laughs> Pinhead. All right. And this and this podcast having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. 
Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.